I'm going to read our scripture lesson today. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm going to begin with verse 5. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you, or even spend the winter, so that you may send me on my way wherever I go. I do not want to see you now just in passing, for I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Would you join me, please, for a moment of prayer? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, which are thy strength and our redeemer. Amen. I want to begin today by sharing with you four statements which I feel represent the thinking of countless numbers concerning the modern church. The first statement was made by a rather discouraged servant of the church. This servant said, the modern church is like the referee of an athletic contest who has swallowed his, his, his whistle and can no more either direct or control the game. The second statement was made by a candidate being interviewed for the Episcopacy of the United Methodist Church. This candidate said, we have good theology, we have good worship, we have good inclusiveness. But he said, we have lost our passion. We've lost our sense of urgency. The third statement was made by a lady in a church who was concerned about her worship services on Sunday. And she said, I kept waiting for the casket to come down the aisle. And the fourth statement was made in a conversation that I recently had with a friend. And this friend said, how do you think the church will even be around in its present form in the middle of the 21st century? Now all of this, I say all of this represents the church at the midnight hour. The church in retreat. The question needs to be raised, when will the retreat stop? And the question was put very well by a concert violinist by the name of Old Bull when he was asked to go to church with a friend. He said, I'll go to church with you on one condition, that you take me to hear someone who will tempt me to the impossible. When will the modern church move out of the midnight hour, stop the retreat, and tempt this world of ours to the impossible? I think this has already begun to dawn. A few years ago, I was in Varna, Bulgaria, with the executive committee of the World Methodist Council. The church in Varna, the Methodist church, was 150 years old, but it had been closed for the previous 30 years because under communist domination, the church had been turned into a mariner's show and the clergy had been taken off and imprisoned. When we were there, the church had just been opened a year and a half. And let me tell you, it was so crowded on the worship services, you could not even get into the church. They had to have the Sunday school in the backyard because they didn't have room for the people. Well, this church, they were planning to build a new church. We saw the plans. We were there for the groundbreaking. They were planning to build a new church right in the center of the city, right in the center of a communist city at that. How very appropriate. The pastor of the Varna Church was speaking to the executive committee, and he said, our people are full of enthusiasm. And he said, they're full of enthusiasm because God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? This is something of the spirit of Paul in Ephesus. Who could possibly imagine that this Jew, in the midst of all this opposition and paganism, was going to challenge Ephesus to become Christian? We're talking about pagan Ephesus, where this notorious Diana of the Ephesians pagan temple. We're talking about Ephesus with all of its way out thinking. We're talking about Ephesus with no church in view. This little Jew with a Christ-inspired vision was going to challenge Ephesus to become Christian. So I ask again, when will the modern church move out of the midnight hour 
stop the retreat and tempt this world of ours to the impossible. The church singing at midnight, I have some suggestions for you. First of all, the church singing at midnight will refocus on Jesus Christ as the center of its certainty. The Apostle Paul said, I know whom I have believed. Notice the object of his belief was not what, but whom. Whom is the arresting word? Howard Eddington was the former dynamic pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Orlando, Florida. And he said, my granddaddy said, things will either change or disappear. And he said his grandfather had disappeared himself because he had lost a four-year struggle to cancer. He said the family that used to be in one place was now scattered to North Carolina and New Hampshire and Florida and Texas. He said even the old home place that used to be at 1305 Dauphin was no more. He said his grandfather was right when he said things will either change or disappear. But then his grandfather said, but Jesus never will. Jesus never will. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something better than a cause. And that is love for and loyalty to a person, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Why should we in the church always start anew with Jesus? Two reasons. First of all, church renewal and new life has always begun when the church became sensitive anew to Jesus. Back in the 13th century, Francis of, of Assisi courageously withstood the opposition of the papacy to call the church back to a consideration of the example of Jesus. He tried to live as Jesus lived. He tried to love as Jesus loved. And the historians tell us that it was his life and work that paved the way for the Protestant Reformation. 300 years later, the church came to one of its darkest hours. The institution had become a political hierarchy, corrupt, powerful, and spiritually barren. Ignatius Loyola turned away from inherited influence and wealth in Spain to call the church back to the example of New Testament faith, and we are told that his movement brought new power to a decadent institution. When we think of Martin Luther, what do we think of? Freedom of the Christian person, justification by faith. But do you realize that his message was not simply a call to return to the Bible, his message was a call to return to Jesus. And then our own John Wesley was faced by a church that was steeped in ritualism and form, beautiful on the outside, but it was spiritually barren. So what did John Wesley do? He preached Jesus Christ and Christian discipleship. And you know the result, a nation saved and a Methodist church. The other reason for starting with changed human lives, the other reason for starting with Jesus is changed human lives. We simply cannot get around that. Years ago, I was asked to have the prayer at the kickoff of the polio drive for the state of Georgia. They had me seated up there next to Dr. Jacob Pranowski, one of the world's great scientists, who was a fellow at Salt Institute. What was I going to say to one of the world's great scientists? It took me half the meal to get up the nerve to say anything. Finally, I turned to him and I said, wasn't that marvelous what they did in transplanting that heart in South Africa? He turned to me and he said, do you really think so? I said, yes, sir, don't you? He said, preaching what the world needs is not a new heart, but a change of heart. That's what he said, a scientist. When we start dealing with Saul of Tarsus out on the Damascus Road, we're not dealing in the realm of the speculative. Saul said it was the living Christ that met him. And if we want to argue him about it, all we need to do is look at the fact of a permanent change in his life, a change that led to numerous new churches and some of the most beautiful literature this world has ever known. Eddie Fox, for years, was the general secretary of the World Methodist Evangelism Council. Eddie told us at one of our meetings about a fellow that was converted in South America. And when you ask him how he was converted, he said he was converted converted by a farmer. This fellow was a bandit. He wore six guns, a cowboy hat. He wore chaps. He wore all the things. He was a bandit, but he was invited to go to church by a farmer. And while he was in church with his six guns and all, he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was converted. He was converted. 
And then he said this, he said, you know, I don't wear my six guns anymore, but he said, I'm more dangerous than ever. Don't you love that? I don't wear my six guns anymore, but I'm more dangerous than ever. Now, how did I get on the inside of this story of God's grace? I can only speak for me. I didn't know the meaning of life. I didn't know what to do with my sin. I didn't know why I was here. But then I heard by word and example of what Jesus Christ was doing for other people. And by faith, I accepted the fact that Jesus could do that for me. And he has and he is. The church singing at midnight will refocus on Jesus Christ as its center of certainty. And then the church singing at midnight will saturate itself in prayer. Will saturate itself in prayer. There was a teenage boy driving up the road with his best girl in the car. All of a sudden, he stopped the car, turned to his girl, and he said, If I had a hundred eyes, they'd all want to behold your beauty. He said, If I had a hundred arms, they'd all want to hold you close. He said, If I had a hundred lips, they'd all want to kiss you. She looked at him and said, Oh, shut up. You ain't using what you got. (laughs) If we're not saturating ourselves in prayer, we're not using what we have. If we're not saturating ourselves in prayer, we're not using what we have. The book of Acts tells us that just prior to the Holy Spirit's coming, the disciples would gather together in prayer. Prayer was their priority. Too often we make prayer our preamble to the main business, but for them, prayer was the main business itself. Prayer was the main business for those people. On another occasion, I was with the World Methodist Council, and we were in Tallinn, Estonia. We were there for the groundbreaking of the new Baltic Seminary. A hundred people from the World Methodist Council had gone to help them celebrate. These people were going to have a major celebration of the groundbreaking of that new seminary. It was so great. You see, they had been under communist domination from 1990 to 1940. So after 50 years, they were going to celebrate. They had 17 speakers. You think having one's bad. They had 17 speakers. They had music and prayers, and it was so cold. The wind and the rain was coming off that Baltic Sea. I have never been so cold in all my life. I was too cold to get my hands out of my pocket to hold up an umbrella. It was literally freezing to death. And during that occasion, some of those people from the World Methodist Council began to go back and get into the bus. They were so cold, they couldn't last in the ceremony. And quite frankly, I began to think, well, I may go back and get on the bus too. I was just so cold. But just before I did, I whispered to a fellow. I said, I am so cold. And he said to me, when they asked the students in the seminary here why they were in seminary, more than half of them said, because of my grandmother's prayer. And then he said, you see those ladies out there, there were about seven Nothing on their head, very light coats. They were standing out there. He said, those must be the grandmothers. And then he said, you know, I'm just pleased to be standing among the grandmothers. Let me tell you something. You couldn't have forced me out of there with a bulldozer after that. Tears were coming down my face. You see, I was just pleased to be standing among the grandmothers too. Why? Because the grandmothers in their prayer lives saved the church in Estonia from communism. It was their prayers that saved that church. Y'all remember Dr. Williams' home borders? He was a pastor of Wheat Street Baptist Church. He used to pray before his worship services. He would pray, Lord, let something happen here today that's not in the order of worship. I love that. Let something happen here today that's not in the order of the worship. If you depend on organization, you're going to get what organization can do. If you depend on strategy, you're going to get what strategy can do. If you depend on preaching, you're going to get what preaching can do. If you depend on music, you're going to get what music can do. But if you depend on prayer, you're going to get what God can do. That's the point I'm trying to make. If you depend on prayer, you can get what God will do. I remember one year as a young pastor, I went to pastor school, and I heard a preacher, his name was Dr. Hoover Rupert. Dr. Hoover Rupert was the pastor of Michigan State University at the time. He told us, he said, he had always wanted to see that church 
that housed the statue of Jesus. It was in Copenhagen, Denmark. He said one time he happened to be there, so he decided he'd go to that church. He'd heard about it. So he asked a policeman, he said, where is that church that houses the statue of Jesus? He told him. He went running up the block. He said he went into the church door, and he said he looked, and he saw that statue of Jesus, but he couldn't see his face. He saw the statue clearly, but he couldn't see his face. He said other people were crowded around in the sanctuary. And he said, well, I got a minute. So he started putting his hands on the feet of the disciples. The sculptor had put them way up. He started going down, putting his hands on the feet of the disciples. But all the time he was looking at that statue of Jesus. He could see the statue so clearly, but he couldn't see his face. He kept working himself down, those disciples. Finally, he said, he turned around and looked at that statue. There was nobody else in the church but him. He said he just, when he got under the shadow of that great statue, he said he just dropped down to his knees. And he said when he looked up, he was looking straight into the eyes of the master. And then he said something I've never forgotten. He said, you know, we must kneel at his feet before we can look into the master's face. Let me tell you something, beloved. I was in Copenhagen a few years ago, and I had to go see that for myself. And I saw that statue. And you literally have to get on your knees to look up to see the master's face. I think the Methodist church may have been long on program, but sometimes short on prayer. We need to catch up with prayer. We need to catch up with prayer for Jesus' sake, for the church's sake, for the world's sake. We need to catch up on prayer. The church saying at midnight is going to saturate itself with prayer. And then the church saying at midnight is going to march under the banner of the kingdom of God. It's going to march under the banner of the kingdom of God. Christ is our answer to personal needs. But he realized that the church is the blueprint for what the church is supposed to be and do. The kingdom of God is the blueprint for what the church is supposed to be and do in society. You know, they said in the early church, the church lived by the majesty of its beliefs. I absolutely love that. The church lived by the majesty of its beliefs. You know its beliefs. I just want to remind you of a few of these. That God is the God of all humankind and the omnipotent ruler of this universe. That Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God and the Savior of all humankind and races. That the kingdom of righteousness and justice and peace is to be built in this world. That the Christian church is the clearest continuing evidence of the Christian faith across the years. That all of us are brothers and sisters under the fatherhood of God, and that the church is called to be a sign of the kingdom's presence. Let me tell you something. I'm from LaGrange, Georgia. There was a little lady in our hometown. Her name was Ethel Young. And believe it or not, Ethel Young was a Baptist. She was a member of the First Baptist Church. But every Sunday for 25 years, Miss Ethel went to the city county jail to teach the prisoners their Sunday school lesson. It didn't matter to her whether they were white or black or yellow, whether they committed a minor or a major crime. None of that mattered. Every single Sunday she was there teaching the prisoners their Sunday school lesson for 25 years. And then she got sick one Sunday, and she couldn't go. And so she showed me a card that she received, much like the cards that you would send or I would send. But this was the card she received. When I opened it up, they are written in the messiest handwriting I've ever seen with these words. We miss you very much. Sign your boys at the city county jail. You want to know where the kingdom of God is? There it is. Gert Bahanna, some of you may have heard that name, wrote a book called The Late Liz. It's been made into a movie. Gert Bahanna went through three divorces. She was an alcoholic. She tried to commit suicide. But at the age of 50, she was converted to Jesus Christ. After that, she started going around telling people about Jesus. And literally thousands of people were converted because of Gert Bahanna. Not long before she died, somebody said, Hey, Gert, what you been doing lately? She said, Well, I've been doing a lot of speaking around. And she said, But I have to use those dirty gas station restrooms. To go into some of them, you've got to wear a pair of galoshes. 
And she said, one day I complained to the Lord about how this servant of his was being treated. And then I heard him say to me, Hey, Gert, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And I said, Lord, you mean you use these restrooms too? And I realized the next person in that restroom was going to be Jesus Christ. She said, you better believe it made a difference in what I did. She said, I pulled off a, first of all, I picked up those dirty towels on the floor, put them in the trash can. Then I pulled off a clean towel and I wiped off that mirror, wiped off that sink. And then she said, yeah, I wiped off the seat. And I said, well, Lord, there it is. I hope you enjoy it. That's what our Lord's kind of positive doing is all about. No trumpets, no publicity, no fanfare. It's just doing whatever it takes to make life better for those folks who are coming behind us. Somebody said there are two great days in a person's life. The day that person was born and the day that person discovers why. Listen to that again. Two great days in a person's life. The day that person is born and the day that person discovers why. That early church that lived by the majesty of its beliefs, it never lost sight of the infinite worth of a human being, the imperishable value of human souls. And that's the reason it was successful. It looked out over the world through the eyes of Christ. That's the reason it never flew a national or a racial flag. It's because it saw something much bigger. It saw the kingdom of God. That's what we're talking about. The church marches under the banner of the kingdom of God. And then the church needs to redevelop an aggressive attitude. An aggressive attitude. There was a doctor who had a very authoritarian secretary. This man went to see the doctor. He had a headache. And so the secretary said, he said, ma'am, I'd like to see the doctor. I've got a headache. She said, get in that room, close the door, get on, get on the table and pull the sheet up. He said, ma'am, I just got a headache. Get in that room, close the door, get on the table and pull the sheet up. But ma'am, get in that room, close the door, get on the table and pull the sheet up. Well, what do you do? He started down there. He went in the room, closed the door, got up on the table. As he was leaning back, there was a fellow right beside him. He turned to him and said, all this, and I just got a headache. The other fellow said, headache, nothing. I just came in here to read the meter. Think about that for a minute. What is an aggressive attitude? An aggressive attitude is a, a mind alert to opportunity. It's sort of like Paul said, for a wide door for effective work is open to me and many adversaries, but I'm going to stay a while in Ephesus. I'm going to stay a while in Ephesus. That's what it is, an open door and a great responsibility. We need to develop or redevelop an aggressive attitude as far as the church just goes. Let's think a minute just about what he said. He said, Ephesus, pagan Ephesus, an open door and a great responsibility. Let's substitute our 21st century world. Homelessness, poverty, discord between the races, terrorism, ethical dilemmas, the unchurched, meaningful lives, meaningless lives. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the church could see them as they really are, an open door and a great opportunity? That's the reason we need to redevelop an aggressive attitude. We need to understand the issues of our time. It's not time to pull up the, pull up the covers and get under the covers or get under the table. It's time to stand tall for Christ and put some optimism and some hope in this culture because this culture needs it and to talk and speak and spread and act in love so other people can come to see Christians and know that God is in present with us and God cares and God called us to make a difference. There was a minister who was walking through the children's division of his Sunday school and when he was walking through he happened to see this church it's a little wooden church. It takes up the offering and so forth. He said, well, I've got a minute. So he just he wanted to see what it was like. He picked it up to examine it. And when he did, there was a little boy standing beside him. This little boy said, be careful, mister. You've got our church in your hands. 
Be careful, mister. You've got our church in your hands. For a wide door for effective work is open to, to us, and there are many adversaries. Will the church sing again at midnight? Be careful, beloved. You've got our church in your hands. Let us pray. Lord, we're so grateful for this day. And we're grateful for the opportunity of being in this marvelous church. We're thankful for these faithful people who give of their time and effort to bring out its best. We're grateful for Jasmine. We're thankful for the congregation, for the choir, for Arbel, and for all who make up the staff. We pray your blessing upon each and every one of them. Thank you for loving us. Help us to receive and hear what you're trying to say even through an earthen vessel like me. It's in your name. Amen.